Oh, hey, sorry, I just wanted to pop in really quickly to say that we recently hit a really neat milestone of 100,000. So to thank you and to celebrate, I'm giving away some goodies. Details at the end of this video, so stick around. Okay, on with the show. Hello! Odds are you're probably familiar with this happily ever after sail off into the sunset telling of Our Little Mermaid. And today I'm probably gonna ruin it for you a bit. Sorry, how could the tale <laughs> of a nerdy aquatic princess who just wants to be where the people are possibly have anything creepy and morbid going on? Kelp, let's crack open this Disney princess's disturbing origin story. The Little Mermaid's Painful Truth of course this Disney story has a bit of a deep sordid origin. That's why we're here after all. So grab some goggles, flippers, oxygen, etc. as we dive deep into the depths of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. Disney's The Little Mermaid opens up with all of the merfolk and other underwater creatures gathering at the palace to hear a concert performed by King Triton's seven daughters and to hear Ariel debut her most beautiful voice. She of course forgets to show up to the festivities and is instead collecting trinkets for her human shrine grotto thing. More on that later. Her father is furious and embarrassed and has a lot on his hands what with all these teenage daughters, poor guy. Hopping to Anderson's tale, the Mer King is a widower and is only really mentioned in passing. His mother takes care of the most beautiful palace and raises his Six daughters. Now, Anderson takes great pains to let us know how vain he thinks this old merlady is for some reason, describing her as a very intelligent woman, but a little too proud of her rank. She wore 12 oysters on her tail. The nobility were only allowed six. Otherwise, she's pretty awesome and takes excellent care of raising her six granddaughters. Of course, the youngest is the most beautiful and the most odd, too. Each princess has given a garden to tend to, planting whatever colorful plants she wants in whatever shape she wants. And the sister mermaids even include trinkets and treasures from shipwrecks in theirs. I think these gardens are what Disney-based Ariel's own treasure grotto off of. But of all the colors and all the lost items about the ocean floor, the littlest mermaid has only planted red flowers in the shape of the sun. To say that she was obsessed with how the sun looked from underwater would be an understatement. And under a red tree in the center of her design, she has placed a single clear marble statue of a boy that has fallen to the ocean floor. Hmm, I see. I see. Oh yeah, fun fact, Disney's Ariel gives Triton a red flower when she is absentmindedly in the... Maybe that's a little nod to this older tale. In the movie, Triton is angry that Ariel went up to the surface, again, as it is forbidden. In Anderson's story, once a merfolk reaches 15 years of age, they are permitted to go to the surface as often as they would like. But our littlest mermaid and her sisters are far younger than 15 when the tale starts off, so they pass their days underwater, either gardening or else listening to their grandmother's tales of the surface. The Littlest takes all these stories in, and as each of her sisters turns 15 and returns with tales of her own, she grows more and more obsessed. Even though the surface is old news to them, they all occasionally go above the waves when the storms are fierce to sing to sailors, who are about to die, about how great life is under the sea, begging them to join them under the waves, not really caring that in order for a human to see the underwater palace, they would probably be, well, dead. Fun times, fun times. Whenever they would go off all holding hands and do this, Littlest would remain behind, wanting to weep her heart out. But because mermaids can't cry, their suffering is even deeper and greater. Finally, the Littlest Mermaid turns 15. The grandmother dresses her up with a wreath of flowers made of pearls and even lets eight oysters clamp themselves onto the Littlest tail. It really hurts, but the Dowager Queen says, one has to suffer for position. A line which Littlest takes way too literally later in her tale, and with that, Littlest heads to the surface. Just like in Disney, she sees the birthday festivities of a handsome prince aboard a large ship. Just the same, she cannot stop looking at him, even with all the wild fireworks and such. Here too, a storm is brewing, and it takes Littlest a while to realize that the ship is in danger. At first, she's excited to have the handsome prince visit her father's palace, but then remembers, dead. Right, so she hurries to save him instead from drowning and carries him through the water all night, stroking his soaking hair, passionately kissing him on his forehead, and wishing with all her might that he might live. Also, she realizes he looks like her glass statue back in her garden. Eventually in the morning, she sees a shore, where there's a cloister or a church. She doesn't know which. It seems safe and protected, so she leaves the prince in the bay there. When a bell rings and a gaggle of girls starts strolling in the garden, the littlest mermaid hides. Eventually, one of the girls, the youngest, most beautiful, of course, but the prince's body and calls for help to carry it into the big white building. Unlike in Disney, the littlest mermaid has no song to link her as the rescuer in the prince's mind. We can see the tragedy unfolding already, made more sorrowful because mermaids can't cry. 
She grows morose and despondent and only finds comfort by hugging the glass statue of the man in her garden. All of her other plants grow distended, making the sun garden more of a jungle. Eventually, she breaks down and tells one of her sisters about the human, and because words among trusted mermaids travel fast, the friend of another sister gives Littlest the name and kingdom of her lost prince. So begins the Littlest mermaid stalking phase. Every night, she makes her way inland and hides in a canal beneath his balcony just to watch him. She overhears fishermen saying how good and kind the prince is, and she falls even more in love with him. She replays the memory of his head resting on her chest and how passionately she kissed him, but is sad because he knew nothing about his rescue and could not even dream of her. Months of stalking ensue and Littlest is falling more and more in love with humans in general. How big their countries are, forests, birds, mountains. She just wants to live among them, to be where the people are, as it were. So she goes to her grandmother to get the lowdown on human lifespans. Mermaids, it turns out, live for 300 years, but when they die, they become foam on the ocean. Humans, her grandmother tells her, have much, much shorter lifespans, but have an immortal soul, and after they die, rise up into the unknown, the beautiful world that we shall never see. Humans have an afterlife. Merfolk become foam, like they never existed. The littlest decides that more than anything, she wants an immortal soul too. Grandma warns her that we live far happier down here than man does up there. Life is just the bubbles down here. But Littlest begs her to tell her how to win an immortal soul. Only if a man should fall so much in love with you that you were dearer to him than his mother and father, and he cared so much for you that all his thoughts were of his love for you, and he let a priest take his right hand and put it in yours, while he promised to be eternally true to you, then his soul would flow into your body and you would be able to partake of human happiness. He can give you a soul and yet keep his own. But it'll never happen because they think stumpy legs beautiful and fishtails gross. Basically, and this is just my read on this, you will need to make a man upset obsessed with you, marry you, and he will give you a soul. But this flowing into you stuff makes it sound like the soul is a child and not a soul for the mermaid? Does this formula work if a merman fell for a human woman? Or would that child be soulless because the father's flowing essence is soulless? What about a mermaid and a human woman? Stop complicating this brain. A lot of the soul business seems to ride on the human man. What if he cheats? He won't be eternally true anymore, so is that soul taken away? Stop brain. Anyway, Merkingdom is having a ball, but Littlest is so obsessed now with the idea of an immortal soul and realizes now that she loves the prince more than her father and dead mother, thinks only of her love for him and would be eternally bound to him. So she slips out of the palace and pays a visit to the sea witch, although she has always been quite afraid of her. Right, so Disney introduces their villain, the exiled Ursula, fairly early on. She's been spying on Ariel as she thinks she may be the key to Triton's undoing. Only after Triton destroys Ariel's grotto do Flotsam and Jetsam intervene and direct Ariel to Ursula. Ursula takes a more active role in the movie, which makes sense as the film needed a villain to sort of keep it moving. In the original tale, there is no such villain, but I think instead the Littlest Mermaid's own moral code and motivations. Just like Ursula, the sea witch lives in a remote part of the ocean, although to get to her neck of the woods, Littlest has to swim where no mermaid has been before, past a maelstrom or a great whirlpool that threatens to swallow her into its depths past bubbling mud flats in a bog and through the strangest forest. All of the bushes and trees were giant polyps that were half plants and half animal, with slimy arms and fingers as supple as worms that tried to grab Littlest, who had thoughtfully braided her hair to keep it from ensnaring her. The worst part about this forest is the thousands of human remains from a myriad shipwrecks, arms and skulls and all partially decomposed. Also, land animals, ship parts, and the occasional poor unfortunate mermaids who have been caught up and strangled. This this is a bit more extra and creepy than the soul garden to Ursula's bone hovel. Like Ursula, this sea witch also lives in a bone den, although rather than a whale type skeleton, her hovel is made of drowned humans' bones exclusively. Unlike Ursula, she has no real nefarious motivations. She only extracts the price required for the magic asked of her, and is not exiled but just exists on the edge of the realm. Kind of like a Murbaba Yaga, if you will, neither good nor evil, just dangerous. Ursula wants to set Ariel up to fail so that she can use her as a bargaining chip with Triton, I think. Her deal, of course, is if the prince kisses her with true love's kiss by sunset on the third day of becoming human, Ariel will remain a human. This seems pretty simple when compared with the level of commitment the littlest mermaid needs in Anderson's. If no kiss happens, Ariel becomes part of Ursula's garden. Oh, of course, payment is Ariel's voice, which Eric recognizes as the voice of his rescuer. Ariel agrees, signs the contract, and is immediately turned human. How cruel, though? I mean, she 
least seems miles below water. She must be able to hold her breath for eons. Thankfully, Flounder and Sebastian are there to help. Anyway, back in Anderson, Littlest shows up, and the witch, letting her pet toad eat out of her mouth and holding her eels, which she calls her chickens, close to her spongy chest, already knows why she is there. She says that it is a stupid wish, for it will only bring the princess misery and suffering. But if Littlest is set on the idea, it's a good thing she came today for a day later and the magic would have to wait another hundred years. Ain't that just the way? She then describes the agony of what drinking the magic potion on land will do. Your tail will divide and shrink into pretty legs. It will hurt. It will feel as if a sword were going through your body. You will be the most beautiful human child ever seen and will walk more gracefully than any dancer. But every time your foot touches the ground, it will feel as though you were walking on knife so sharp that your blood must flow. If you're willing to suffer all this, I can help you. Littlest says, yes, yeah, she's willing. More caution from the witch. Once you have a human body, you can never again become a mermaid. If you fail in your mission to make this prince fall in love with you, marry you, win the immortal soul, etc., then the first morning after he has married another, your heart will break and you will become foam on the ocean. There is no three-day time limit here, but just that the prince cannot marry another. And Littlest still has to pay the witch as well, for the potion will require a lot of the sea witch's own blood. The price? The Littlest Mermaid's tongue. She agrees, and after cleaning the cauldron with some eels for cleanliness as a virtue, the witch cuts open her own chest and lets her blood flow into the mix. Once complete, the potion is somehow crystal clear, but before handing it over, the witch cuts off Littlest's tongue, rendering her mute really shines a new light on Ursula's line. She who holds her tongue hits the man. Ew. Oh, also this stuff is hecka powerful. The sea witch says that if any of the polyps give Littlest trouble on her way out of her lands, to pour a drop of the potion on it and it will shatter into a thousand pieces. So just what is this stuff gonna feel like ingested? No thanks. Okay, so far Disney has been mostly on par with Anderson's tale, even if the older version is a bit more gruesome and drawn out. But here is where things change for the grimmer. More creepy and gory details, of course, but a lot more emotional torture for our littlest mermaid, too. At this point in Disney, Ariel wakes up on the shore, still clad in her clamshells and with two amazing sets of toes and legs, of course, of course. She's awfully clumsy at this whole new walking business, and by the time Eric finds her, she has a makeshift gown, courtesy of Scuttle. There is just something about her, so Eric takes her into the palace, where she is treated like visiting royalty, honestly. Fancy baths, gowns, dinners, and even outings with the prince, in what has to be one of my favorite Disney dresses. Anyway, it's mostly fun in the sun and a whole lot of wooing and body language, because we've got to get that kiss in before sunset on the third day. Now for Anderson. Poor Littlea swims up to shore in front of the prince's castle and downs the potion. It feels like a sword piercing her little body and hurts so bad she faints and lays there as if she were dead. She wakes up to the sun burning her body and the prince standing over her nude form. She is shellless and has no friendly seagull to filter her sail. So she quickly covers her front with her own hair. The prince asks her questions but she can't respond obviously so she just puppy eyes him until he guides her up to the castle. She is so graceful on her feet and all who see her apparently question how anyone could walk so lightly, but each step to her feels like she's walking on sharp, sharp knives. Once at the palace, she is clad in silk and muslin and is no gas but a slave girl. <laughs> yeah. The other slave girls are all dressed in fine silk and gold and sing for the prince, who smiles at them. Being mute, Littlest feels sorrowful at being left out, but then the other girls start to dance, and Littlest feels compelled to shine. She is the most beautiful of them all, and the most graceful too, even though her delicate feet are torture devices. The prince is so delighted with her that he calls her his little thumbling, and asks that she be allowed to sleep on a pillow outside of his door, like a pet. Littlest thinks over and over again with each painful step, if only he knew what I gave up to be with him, which, once this tale is told, will seem very sad indeed. There are no fancy gowns for this Littlest Mermaid. The prince has men's clothes made for her so she can accompany him when he goes horseback riding. They adventure and hunt and climb those mountains Littlest was obsessed with, but by this point in the tale her feet are bleeding so much that other people start to notice. She just smiles through it all, twisted as that is, and waits until dark each night to walk to the sea to cool her burning feet. 
Eventually, her sisters show up to check on her and tell her how much pain she has caused them with her absence and how they love her, but she cannot reply. They visit every night to keep her company, and eventually even the vain grandmother and Merking surface for the first time in years, but they dare not get closer to speak to her. Sorrow has certainly descended on this family. Anyway, the prince grows fonder and fonder of Littlest as the days pass. Yes! But loves her as he would have loved a good child. Oh, bummer. Guy has zero romantic interest in his pet dancing girl, but strings her hope along anyway, unbeknownst to him, of course. Saying things like, You are dearest to me and have the kindest heart of all. You are devoted to me and look like a young girl I saw long ago who I'll never see again. I was in a shipwreck, you see, and when I washed up on the beach, she saved me. I only saw her twice, but she is the only one in this world I can love. You sort of look like her almost enough to make her memory disappear, and that eases my suffering. For you see, she belongs to a holy temple, and I'll never see her again. At least you and I will always be friends and never part, etc. Littlest is beyond sad that he has no clue she actually saved him, but she can't cry because mermaid, so the grief is compounded. She contents herself by saying essentially, this arrangement is mine, and I will love him and devote myself to him, painful feet, painful heart, and all. But naturally, the prince must get married. The neighboring kingdom has great holdings and a beautiful princess, so a magnificent ship is built for the prince to inspect the kingdom. But the townspeople know he's really going to inspect the princess. We all know how this is going to end. Anyway, before leaving, the prince tells Littlest, If I ever marry, I shall most likely choose you, my little foundling with the eloquent eyes, and kisses her, lays his head to rest so near to her heart that the promise of the immortal soul is once again a possibility. She is shaking so much for the idea of happiness that the prince asks her if she's shaken because she's afraid of the ocean. And then veritably mansplains, human explains all about the sea to the mermaid. As Anderson puts it, she smiled as he talked for who knew better than she about the world on the bottom of the ocean. Poor girl smiles through everything. The ship docks and eventually the prince meets the princess. Of course, she is the very same one that found him on the beach and saved his life. She was only at the holy temple in the first place to learn all of the royal virtues. Wow, what luck. Anyway, prince turns to the littlest and says he is now the happiest man alive and you will share my joy for I know that you love me more than any of the others do. Ouch. Littlest kisses his hand as her heart breaks for his wedding morning spells her death. Then it all goes awry. Things kick into high gear, high stakes in both tales. In Disney, Ursula shows up with a voice that enchants Eric, and the next day they are to be married. Wow, yeah, that happened fast, but we only had three days, and this movie is only an hour and 20-ish minutes. We've gotta move, people! We know what happens. Ariel and co. find the truth out, do everything they can to stop that wedding. Ursula's spell is broken, and Ariel gets her voice back, but too late! She is now a mermaid and under Ursula's contract. Triton tries to stop it, but instead sacrifices himself in his daughter's place. Eric, now knowing the truth about Ariel, harpoons Ursula and eventually impales her with a ship. True love wins! We have love, a wedding, and even parental approval and magic that makes it all possible. All the merfolk show up too, even. A true happily ever after. But not for her, Littlest Mermaid, of course. Because she is the prince's favorite, she gets to hold the train of the bride's dress. Finally dressed in fancy silk and gold, she follows the princess to the altar step by painful step, but cannot hear the music or see the wedding, for this night would bring her death. The happy couple, and littlest of course, board the wedding ship. A very fancy wedding night tent of scarlet and gold with soft pillows sits on the main deck. And all through the night, the evening's dancing takes place around it. I'm mentioning it because dang, poor littlest, that is a terrible visual to see on your last night of life. Anyway, of course, our mermaid dances more elegantly and beautifully than she ever has in her short life, and the knives cut into her feet deeper than ever before. But that physical pain is nothing compared to the pain in her heart. She is sad that this is the last night she will see the man she sacrificed her voice, her family, her very life for. But she's not sad about dying, if I'm reading this right. She dances and laughs with the others until midnight, but with the thought of death in her heart. Then the prince and princess retire to their love tent and the littlest prepares herself to be foam. 
One by one, all of her sisters appear above the waves, all of their hair gone. They've traded it to the sea witch in order to save Littlest. If only she will take the dagger they bought with their hair and, before the sun rises, plunge it into the heart of the prince. When his warm blood sprays on her feet, they will turn into a fishtail and she will be a mermaid again. She will get to keep her 300 years of life and oh yeah, even the vain grandmother is mourning her, they say. All her hair has fallen out from grief, but maybe that's why she's mourning though. Anyway, either Littlest dies tomorrow or the prince does. Littlest enters the crimson tent with a dagger in hand just before dawn. She sees the princess lying on the prince's handsome chest and Littlest kisses the prince's forehead. She looks at the sky, to the prince, to the sky, to the prince, etc. as the sun starts to peek over the horizon. He stirs slightly and whispers his wife's name in his sleep and she knows she cannot do it. She throws the dagger into the sea and the waves turn red where it fell, like drops of blood were seeping up through the water. She looks one last time at the prince and then throws herself into the sea, feeling herself becoming foam. But then, the sun rises and Littlest does not feel death. She sees her beloved son and for the first time in her life feels a tear. Hooray! She also barely sees hundreds of airy spirits floating above her and filling the ship's sails, singing with the barest whispers of voices. Finally, Littlest asks, where am I? <gasps> Gasp! She has a voice back! She's now joined the ranks of Daughters of the Wind because of her good deed. They are spirits that also have no mortal souls, but can earn them through 300 years of good deeds on Earth. Things like blow cool wind in plague areas to disperse it, help dry laundry, carry the smell of flowers to refresh the sick, etc. Because of all her suffering, Littlest gets another chance to win her soul, and another 300 years to do it. However, this is kind of a very raw deal for the wind spirits. If they encounter a household with a good child in it, their 300 year sentence on earth is shortened by a year. Cool. But if they come across a bad child in their travels, a year is added to their sentence. <laughs> what? I mean, why should bratty kids have anything to do with their lifespans? It's all random. I think it's a moral takeaway for children reading this tale. Like, be sure to behave and be an angelic child because you never know if the wind spirit that is randomly blowing through your house is the spirit of the littlest mermaid herself and you don't want to make her suffer any more than she already has, do you? But like, if there was a bratty child, they absolutely would want to make her suffer, so they would just keep being bad? Eh? Poor littlest mermaid can't even catch a break in her limbo state of being. Alright, the ending. The prince and princess wake up to stare off into the sea, for they have a feeling Littlest threw herself overboard during the night. Invisible, Littlest kisses the bride's forehead and smiles at the prince. They live on none the wiser to all the Littlest mermaid had sacrificed for them. The end. So that's our dive into the deep, bloody, painful origins of Disney's The Little Mermaid. I do hope you enjoyed hearing this tale. Oh, curveball! If you met with the sea witch and could get any wish granted, would you do it? She only takes the most precious thing you have, after all. Would it be worth it? Magic sure is complicated. Anyway, thank you for watching this video, and wow you all, thank you for following me along on this fantastic YouTube journey as well. We had 100,000 subscribers recently, and my creepy heart is still floored. Like, bottom of the ocean floor. Duh. <laughs> so to thank you, I wanted to do something special. I'll be giving away a choice of a $20 gift card to either Steam or the Nintendo eShop. There will be three winners total. Check out games like Little Nightmares or good old Bendy and the Ink Machine to feed your spooky souls. To enter, click the link in the description below and choose how you'd like to participate. I'll be contacting winners in three weeks, so do be sure to check your email. Kelp, that's all for now, but hey, you can follow me elsewhere and see behind the scenes stuff while I work on the next video, if that's your jam and stuff. Oh, and do subscribe here if you haven't yet, but like what you've seen. Okay, see you soon in the next video, but do mind the wind spirits meanwhile. Goodbye!